Hey everyone, welcome back to Seeker Plus. I am Trace and I'm here with a special guest I'll introduce in a minute. Today we're talking about batteries. We're continuing our conversation from the last part, so make sure you go back and watch that. If you'd like an audio version of this podcast, stay tuned. We're going to have that next week. You can also go and subscribe on wherever you get your podcasts and you'll get a new podcast every single week of Seeker Plus. It's pretty great. Okay, so batteries. We've already established they kind of suck. So let's talk about how we can make them a lot better. So we brought in Dr. Alex Urban. He's a scientist at UC Berkeley, and he is a battery expert. Is that correct? Well, I, I hope that's correct. And I'm so happy to he be here, Trace. And um, yeah, so. Yeah. I'm glad that you were able to make it across. Actually, he was at Berkeley. Now he lives in Scotland. So it was quite the trip. I think it's the furthest we've ever had a guest come from. <laughs> well, my pleasure to be here, so. <laughs> Great, well, let's talk about lithium ion batteries specifically. Those are the batteries that we see most often, I think, or interact with the most often. They're right. in all of our devices, in all of our phones and computers, and right, even right. in cars and things. So briefly, can you kind of explain how a lithium ion battery works? Sure, absolutely. So, and, and let me emphasize that the technological revolution of the last decade would not have been possible without lithium ion batteries. So, as you already said, our smartphones, our tablets, our variable electronics, everything is driven by lithium ion batteries. And um, on the smallest scale, basically, a battery is an electrochemical cell consisting of two electrodes, a cathode and an anode, submerged in a liquid electrolyte. And the cathode material in lithium ion batteries contains lithium ions, so that lithium is a metal, and uh, these are positively charged metal atoms. And when the battery is charged, these lithium ions are pulled out of the cathode and uh, enter the electrolyte. And this process is then reversed when the battery is used. So when you discharge the battery, when you use your smartphone, the lithium ions go back into the cathode. So that's why the cathode material is really one of the most crucial parts of the lithium ion battery. Mm. Okay, and so then once that happens, it, puts, it pushes the electrons through the device and keeps everything running. Right, simultaneously, exactly. When the lithium ions are pulled into the electrolyte, mm. electrons are pulled out to the external circuit, and then when the battery is discharged, this process reverses, and the electrons are what really is then doing the work and driving the devices. It sounds like what you're saying is that the lithium ions don't just sit there. It, I think of the battery as just a solid thing. It's a, you know that solid black thing with writing yeah, on it, but right? It's not, yeah. they, they, uh, the lithium ions are physically moving around inside of that battery? Absolutely, absolutely. Batteries are very dynamic. And lithium is, is going from the cathode side to the anode side. So that's how you have to think about it. Lithium is really shuttling between the two electrodes, between the cathode and the anode. And that's what is charging and discharging. And that's also what's wearing down the batteries. So that's why they don't live forever. Mm. Because this process, of course, changes the structure of the of both electrodes, and uh, over longer periods of time, they start to degrade and the structure becomes unstable. So yes, the batteries are actually dynamic things; they are not static. That is so cool. It makes me yeah. think of like a well-used road. You know, at first <laughs> the road is new; right, it's right. like all oh, the paint is nice, it's like right, the right, right the right color, and then over time you start to get the grooves where the tires drive and the right. lines start to degrade, and you just need a new road. You know, because people are driving back and forth on it all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow, that's super neat. Yeah, and so it's not only the capacity that counts, but also the rate with which lithium can diffuse through the through the entire system. That gives us the time that it takes to charge or discharge the battery. So the faster lithium can diffuse, the faster you can charge your smartphone or your your electric vehicle. So that's also an important factor. Hmm. Yeah. Super cool. But I would like to get back to the cathode material that, sure. I, that I mentioned before. So what is really important for the energy storage capacity of the battery is the material that the cathode is made of. And here we are really stuck because the material that was first proposed for lithium ion batteries, lithium cobalt oxide, so that's, that's containing lithium, but also the transition metal cobalt, was proposed in 1980 and is still being used today. So that's still the material that's used in iPhones, for example, huh. and other smartphones. And, uh, and it's just working so well, and it's really hard to improve um, over it. Oh, OK. Yeah. Is there any other kind of metal that people think we could use other than cobalt? So other, other commercialized batteries contain cobalt in mixtures with other transition metals. So for example, nickel and manganese, also aluminum. 
But there's always cobalt and all these materials have the same crystal structure and that's the key point here. So all these cathodes are layered materials. So that's, those are oxides, but then in between of the oxygen atoms you have layers of transition metal, so cobalt for example, and then lithium, and then again transition metal, lithium, so it's a layered structure. Mm. And on one hand that's good because from such a structure lithium can be extracted easily because all the lithium is in one layer. But on the other hand, it comes with a limitation. You can never extract all of the lithium because then the layer would collapse. So mm -hmm. if you remove all of the lithium from the lithium layer, the material would become unstable. And then the battery just wouldn't work and the, anymore. And then you cannot, you cannot discharge the battery anymore. It's just over. Mm. Interesting. Huh. There's also, um, you know, we, in the research for this episode, we also talked about disordered cathodes. What, what's a right. disorder? Right, that's where the disorder comes in. Because now we went away from this layered structure and we tried something different. We tried a crystal structure where lithium and transition metal sits everywhere, sits on the same sides. So there are no distinct lithium and transition metal layers anymore. But lithium and transition metal atoms share the same, the same sides in the structure. Okay. And that only works for compositions that contain more lithium than transition metal. Okay. But once that is given, that's no problem. We don't need the layering. And so this was a big step to discover because that allows us to extract substantially more lithium from the structure because the transition metal sits everywhere and stabilizes the structure so you don't have collapsing layers anymore. And um, so the disordering really gives us much greater capacities. We can double the capacity that lithium cobalt oxide has. And that's just by going from a very organized structure to a disorganized exactly, structure. Exactly, exactly. Uh -huh. and, and is that because yeah. it doesn't, it, it can maintain its kind of rigidity because exactly. of the disorder? Exactly. Huh, how interesting. That's, that's precisely the reason. So the transition metal stabilizes the structure and we can pull out more lithium from the crystal structure. So. What are the biggest problems with lithium ion batteries? I mean, we've all seen the, the news media, they explode and all of that. But aside right, from that, right. like what, what are the problems with batteries as we know them today? Like why, why do they have so many problems? <laughs> well, I mean, I don't think they have so many problems, oh, okay. but, they, but, but it would just be better to store more energy in them, just yeah. to have batteries that have larger capacities so that we can really have electric vehicles, with, for example, with the same range as, uh, as gas-fueled vehicles. So that would be great. And that's what we have been working on mainly during the last years. Um, but of course, what you mentioned, also safety issues are also a big problem. So the liquid electrolytes that I mentioned earlier are inflammable. And so all the battery fires that you have heard about, the Dreamliner fire, for example, or the, the Samsung Galaxy disaster, that was all because the liquid electrolyte started burning, combusted. And so, so people are working on replacing these combustible parts also. Why is it combustible? What is it about it that causes it to catch fire. So it's just a, uh, it's just an organic solvent, if you wish. So just like alcohol <laughs> and and it burns really well. And so if anything goes wrong, if once there is a short circuiting, for example, the electrolyte ignites and the battery blows up. Mm. And so one pathway to avoid that is to replace actually the liquid electrolyte with a solid, a solid ion conductor. And people are working on that. So that's like solid state batteries that we've actually talked about on Seeker before. It's, right. Okay, really yeah. cool. that, that's an important topic. So we already covered that. Yeah. Well, I mean, tell us a little bit about like why is solid state battery, why, why is it so exciting? Yeah, I mean, the safety issue that I told you about before is, of course, the one big motivator. Another is that um, having a solid would enable us to use lithium as one of the electrodes, so as, the, as the anode material, actually, and lithium metal would make for the ideal battery. Right now, that's not possible because with a liquid electrolyte, little lithium wires, dendrites, would start growing across the electrolyte and would result in a short circuit eventually. And so that can be avoided with a solid electrolyte, possibly. So we are not quite there yet. <laughs> right. Um, so that's the hope. So uh, on the show, we talk a lot about graphene. We love graphene. <laughs> it's great. Um, yeah. And we also, in doing research to talk to you, uh, saw graphene electrode girders. So what are those exactly? And well. is graphene really <laughs> everything that we think it is? <laughs> so let me tell you that the 
A node material. So I'm so far we talked about the cathode, but now the other electrode, the A node in most batteries is actually graphite. And mm -hmm. you know graphite is just many layers of graphene. Right. And and so that's not anything extraordinary. Every commercial battery that you are using, or most of them, is really using graphite. Mm -hmm. And so of course some people have explored if going to graphene or multi-layer graphene, which and already getting closer to graphite is also a good option. And it might, in my opinion, that's, that's just stretching it a little bit. But mm -hmm. uh, well, of course, graphite is cool. Uh, graphene is cool. And so if we can use it for batteries, why not? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what about alternatives to lithium ion? You know, we've seen nickel cadmium batteries in some like lighter devices, not so much the heavy use devices we have now. Yeah. Um, but is there like another step if we were to, to leap into the future, I guess, what would be the next kind of battery we might see? Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a very hot research topic. So um, for once, lithium is relatively rare. And so it might not be actually sustainable to produce enough lithium batteries to transition to only electric vehicles, something like that. And so people are exploring to use sodium ion batteries, for example. You know, sodium is much more abundant. and. Uh, and magnesium ion batteries would also have the advantage that magnesium ions carry uh, two positive charges per atom. So mm -hmm. in principle, you can store twice as much energy with magnesium ion batteries as you can with lithium ion batteries. So that's a very active research field right now, but it's not working quite well yet. So mm -hmm. that will t still take a little while until we actually will see magnesium ion batteries, but they definitely are very promising. So when you say it's an active research area, are people, is it like trial and error? You take some magnesium <laughs> and you put it yeah. here and then you put an electrode on it and you put some electrolyte in the middle and you just kind of see what happens or is it is it more theoretical than that? So to some extent it's trial and error, but I'm very happy that you asked me this question because my background is quite different. I'm actually doing simulations. Oh. so. The group that I'm coming from is doing both simulations and experiments. But what my specific expertise is, I actually simulate how atoms move through this battery. So what we just talked about, that's exactly what I'm doing. And that's where we start with alternative battery technologies also. So we really calculate the diffusion barriers for magnesium, for example, through different materials and then determine which materials would be best suited for batteries. So mm -hmm. that's something that we can do in the computer before we even go to the lab and start making batteries. So that's, Whoa, that's, that's really neat. I find that pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> so the physical laws that describe atomic interactions, I mentioned that earlier, are well known. So that's quantum mechanics. And so what I'm doing essentially is I'm solving these very complicated equations in an approximate numerical way. And there are already commercial programs, computer software is already available that can do that. So it's actually pretty simple. I just need the atomic structure, that's the input, and then I uh, use one of these programs and I get out as an output, I get the energy. Mm. And so I can rank different structures by the energy and the lowest energy structure is the most stable one and that will be the one that we observe in nature. So that's in a nutshell how these kind of simulations work. I also like the fact that you're like, oh, quantum mechanics. Yeah, we've got, we've got a lot of that figured out. It just seems so complicated <laughs> from where I'm sitting. You know? Well, with paper and pencil, it certainly is. But we do already have software that solves all these complicated equations for you. So you mm -hmm. don't actually need to think too much about all these complicated yeah. physical Yeah, so it's good to know stuff. it, but it's not necessarily, you don't have to use it every single day in terms of figuring things out. Right. Of course, you should know how it works. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, but but. It's good to have already software that does the job for you. you know? yeah. But of course, there's a lot behind, a lot of technology behind. So these kind of simulations can be computationally very demanding, especially for real, realistic materials like battery materials that contain defects. And uh, we, we talked about disorder before. And so it's not just one structure. And so for these kind of simulations, we actually need supercomputers. And so here at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, we have one of the uh, fastest supercomputers in the world. And, um, and that's what we are using for this kind of simulation. So it's not on a, on a laptop computer, but it's actually on a, on a real big uh, <laughs> thing with, with, with a lot of power. Yeah, so. That's, that's yeah. got to be really exciting, yeah. like as a scientist to be like, 
I'm going to use a supercomputer. For yeah, this. it is. It is. It is. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's 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 really cool when you think about that. You can use one of the fastest computers in the world for your research. How did you yeah. uh, get into studying this? You know, what excites you about about batteries? You know, yeah, batteries right, are something right. that are so ubiquitous. Right. Most people don't think twice about them. But right. So as I told you, I come from atomistic simulations, and that's kind of a little bit exotic topic. And mm -hmm. so after I completed my PhD, I. I thought to myself, what can I do with that skill? So what are the important challenges, important questions in the world and to which could I contribute to? So atomistic simulations are maybe not well suited to cure cancer or something like that. But as it turned out for batteries, these kind of simulations are really, really useful because we can look at all these atomistic processes. And as the global energy problem is definitely there and has to be solved. We need a solution for it urgently. Mm -hmm. And so it was no question for me that this is a direction to go into. That's so neat. Yeah. I mean, I guess it is fascinating to think about how atoms move around. You know, we have a number of, of episodes that we've talked about atoms moving, but even just thinking about them moving on a daily basis, that must be really <laughs> exciting, I feel like. It's also much safer. Nothing can explode. You can't, you can't <laughs> accidentally poison yourself or anything yeah, like that. You just that. don't want to get a computer virus is all. <laughs> exactly. <most> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, don't get me wrong. In the end of the day, we want to have a real battery. And so it's really crucial for me to work together with experimental colleagues to then try out um, the battery materials in the lab or also it goes vice versa they come to me and found something interesting experimentally and then ask me to explain what they are looking at and mm -hmm. so it's really it's really a very close interaction a couple practical questions uh, how often do you charge your phone do you have <laughs> are there tips that we could have on how lithium-ion batteries should be taken care of my right, uh, right. my dad is obsessed yeah. with batteries yeah. uh, we used to have to take the phone off of the hook so that it would die and before we were allowed to put it back onto the hook yeah. he was he was weird like that yeah so for lithium-ion batteries um, I already mentioned that most of the cathode materials have this layered structure and that it's not good to extract all of the lithium from it so for lithium-ion batteries it's actually better not to charge them completely mm. so if you charge them to 80 percent or something like that and then start recharging when you hit 30 percent that will increase the lifetime of the battery significantly cool. so that would be one advice yeah so yeah. you kind of like keep it in the middle yeah but of course in the end, that's maybe not so practical. We all charge our phones overnight, so we just plug it in before we go to sleep, and then it's 100% when we wake up. So that's not good for the battery, but more convenient. So the last question I have uh, on this round is, do you think we're ever going to see the perfect battery? You see this in the media all the time. Hey, they've created the perfect battery. But what, what, do you think we'll get there? So what does that even mean? Can you explain to me what, what the perfect battery means? I guess I would say the perfect battery, knowing a little bit about batteries, would probably be a capacitor, to be honest. <laughs> it's like, accept all my electricity, yeah. give it all back to me, please, very efficiently. But yeah. in terms of so, a battery, I guess yeah. one that lasts for a long time, can be recharged mm. as many times as I need it very quickly. And um, I mean, those two things are, are probably the two legs of a perfect battery. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to use capacitors for long-term energy storage. Um, yeah, but, but apart from that, I think what uh, what we talked about earlier, so increasing the capacity, this is really the main objective now. And and the other, the other and safety, of course, we talked about that. But the other factors, for example, how efficiently energy is stored and um, and uh, extracted from the battery, so how much is actually lost in this process, that would also be maybe a factor for an ideal battery. But it's not in, so important in practice once we transition to renewable energy sources and get electricity basically for free from sunlight and from, from wind. So um, I don't think we will see a perfect or ideal battery any soon, but I don't. I also don't think it's needed. Mm, you don't so, think it's needed? Oh, no, I mean, that's not, that's not really the bottleneck here. So it's it's much more important that we increase the energy density, that we can store more energy in the batteries. And but but they don't have to be without loss, in my opinion. Huh. I mean, maybe not everybody is of that but opinion. Still, but yeah. uh, <laughs> that's a cool way to think about it. It's like if yeah. we can create energy in such a way that we don't have to worry about how the energy is created, exactly. then the battery is an intermediary just storing the electricity exactly. until we need it. Exactly. Huh. And if you lose a little bit of energy in the process, it doesn't really matter, in yeah. my opinion. Again. Yeah, so, because yeah. we've collected it from the sun yeah. and it was going to go to waste anyway. Right, right. Wow, what a cool way to think about it. 
Well, thanks so much for coming in and talking to us. This thanks is awesome. for having me. So thanks everyone for tuning into Seeker Plus today. Make sure that again, you subscribe for more. If you want more information on what Dr. Alex Urban's working on, you can find a link down in the description. Come find us on Twitter. I am at Trace Dominguez and we are at Seeker. Thanks for tuning in.